All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've got a lot to cover uh, in this whirlwind tour of salt developments. And so um, I went ahead and put my phone number there and my email. If I don't cover something or I don't get to a topic that you have a question about, um, or you think of a question later today that you wanted to run by, uh, please feel free to send me an email or call me and uh, I, will, I will answer that question for you and, and I won't send you a bill, okay? So uh, that's probably the best part, right? All right, so anyway, <clears throat> let's sort of begin with some things that are finally coming to an end. Uh, it seems like some things never end in state and local tax, but we have a few that have. First of all, the Internet Tax Freedom Act, uh, which was first passed in 1998, okay? And then it was renewed several times. And then uh, the last version of it, which was a permanent uh, Internet Tax Freedom Act version, nevertheless, there were a half dozen or so states that were grandfathered in where they, did, they were still free. They were still allowed to impose a sales tax on internet access. And that is now over, okay? As of July 1st, 2020, nobody should be imposing sales tax on internet access. So, you know, that's that monthly fee you pay to access your, your, your internet provider. Uh, now that said, uh, for those of us who live in Colorado, we have these home rule cities and there are still a couple of home rule cities who think that the law doesn't apply to them. And so they are still trying to, uh, uh, they, they argue that they were grandfathered in and that none of this applies to them anyway. And so therefore they should be able to still collect that tax. But uh, if they do call an attorney and they will probably soon quit uh, doing that. But anyway, so this has finally come to an end. Nobody should be charging tax on this anymore. The LaBelle case appears to have finally come to an end. This is that big brouhaha in Illinois over whether or not Chicago can impose their tax on entertainment services on streaming services. That's what the argument was all about. And uh, anyway, uh, long story short, Chicago wins, we lose, and uh, it's been held constitutional and we probably won't see anything more about that. What we will see, however, is, you know, my, I have this sort of funny belief that whenever some jurisdiction gets away with something, I should probably rephrase that. Uh, let's, let's say, I'll be more polite, and I'll say that when one jurisdiction is successful in their legal endeavors, other jurisdictions will soon follow. So we're going to probably see a lot more uh, states trying to expand their current statutes to include streaming services without changing the law. So uh, watch out for that, but at least in Illinois, in Chicago, the argument is over. This was one of those crazy cases that's been going on for years. This is a, a good example of let's waste a lot of money on litigation uh, instead of just changing the law. What happened was a Louisiana parish went after Walmart and said, look, you're a marketplace facilitator and you should be collecting tax for all those third parties that are on your website, okay? Walmart was collecting tax for their own sales, but they weren't collecting tax for third parties who were selling using their platform to sell. And as you know, in the last year or two, every state except I believe two, Florida and Missouri, have enacted marketplace facilitator laws. Well, Louisiana could have done that, but no, instead they saw big dollars if they went after Walmart. Um, and so this litigation finally comes to a halt and Louisa Supreme, Louisiana Supreme Court rules in favor of Walmart, says they're not a dealer. It's kind of a moot victory because now Louisiana has enacted legislation that applies to marketplace facilitators. It is sort of amazing to me how sometimes these states take on court cases uh, unnecessarily. You got to believe they must have spent, you know, three, four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars to litigate this case. Uh, and this is Louisiana, you know, they're 51. 
out of the uh, 50 states in the District of Columbia and spending on education. You'd think they'd have better things to spend it on, but who am I, right? Okay, so some things never end though. We've got a few things that have ended. Some things never end. And of course, one of the things that never ends is, is California and their $800 fee. Remember we had a case a couple of years ago, SWORT, where uh, they tried to impose, California tried to impose their $800 fee on SWORT and SWORT was um, a, uh, in a limited liability company, but it was not, it was not, it was a, not a member managed LLC. It was, um, had a manager managed LLC. And anyway, they didn't have any authority. They owned a very small interest in this LLC and they were victorious uh, against California and won a case saying that the $800 fee didn't pay to, didn't apply to them. Well, the, where, this issue is not dead. And, and this is a good example of where this drives us all crazy because in this case, We've got an LLC that's a limited partner in another LLC that's doing business in, in California, okay? And so the first LLC is arguing, look, we're not doing business in California. We're simply a limited partner if you were a limited member of another LLC. So we shouldn't have to pay the 800 bucks. And we see that all the time where we have tiered partnerships where California will want $800 from every partnership all the way up. You could have three, four, five, six partnerships. They want $800 from everybody and they want it every year. The problem in this case or the difference in facts here is that unlike SWORT, this LLC that they owned an interest in, okay, they had property in excess of $50,000 in the state. And so California says, look, you've met our economic threshold, whether regardless of your interest in this other LLC, the economic threshold of $50,000 in property has been met. And so you have a filing obligation in the state and you have to pay. So we haven't seen the end of this. This will, we'll probably see more litigation about this. Speaking of California, this was a case that was, I almost, didn't include this because it was actually handed down last May, but it's become such a hot button for everybody. Look at the facts of this Binley case. We've got a writer who's living and working in Arizona, okay? He gets paid to write a couple screenplays for some Hollywood producers. They send him a 1099, they each send him a 1099, he gets about $40,000. The guy's the sole proprietor, okay? Doesn't go to California, not in California. And California gets, you know, they get copies of these 1099s from the feds and they go, well, wait a minute, this guy should be filing a return here in California because he's got income he's earned from California. And, um, you know, the fact that he, that income is only $40,000 is irrelevant because and this is the real key, California argues that his sole proprietorship is carrying on a unitary business within and without California, both inside and outside of California. He's carrying on a unitary business. And everyone's response to this is, say what? A, a unitary, how, how can a sole proprietor be unitary, what, who, who or what is the sole proprietor unitary with? Uh, nevertheless, at the um, Office of Tax, <coughs> excuse me, at the OTA, California wins, and they actually published this as a precedential um, opinion. So watch out for this, because this could apply to anybody. This could apply to, you know, if you've got an accounting practice in New Jersey, and you've got California clients and you do their returns and you never go to New Jersey and you're thinking, well, I'm safe because, you know, their economic threshold for sales for income tax nexus is almost $600,000 now. I'm not over that 600,000. California may start making this argument. We'll see how far it goes, but this is something to, to, to pay attention to. It's, it's gonna come back uh, again and again and again. All right. Um, Something else, this, this issue here, 
I, I threw this case up here just to remind everybody, this is not really new ground, okay? It's oftentimes a new, something new for taxpayers. But for those of us in state and local tax, you know, California has long held this position. New York has long held this position that if you've got stock options that you've earned at a job while working in New York or California or in Ohio, and you retire and move somewhere else, they may not be able to tax your pension, okay, that you're receiving from the company in Ohio or the company in California, but they will be able to tax your stock options. So uh, especially as people are becoming more mobile, uh, this is, it's important reminder to communicate um, if you're a, in public accounting to communicate with your clients and if you're in industry to communicate it with those who may be uh, earning uh, stock options. Okay, uh, what else has not stopped? Well, this is never going to end. How do you define cost of goods sold for Texas? Okay, this has been a perennial issue because, uh, you know, just briefly, uh, you may remember the way the Texas margin tax works is you take your gross receipts everywhere and you get to subtract one of three things. You can either subtract cost of goods sold or you can subtract mm -hmm. uh, payroll or you can take simply a 30% haircut and start with 70% of gross sales, okay, in your calculation. So the more things you could put into cost of goods sold is gonna lower your Texas margin tax base. And, and interestingly enough, the cost of goods sold calculation for the margin tax is not the same as the cost of goods sold calculation for federal tax or anybody else for that matter. And so every year we see ongoing litigation as to what's going to be included in that calculation of cost of goods sold. And so we've got three cases this, this, this last year. This offshore, offshore oil rig services company, they could exclude certain subcontractor payments from their total revenue, but they couldn't exclude it as part of cost of goods sold. So they kind of won the, they, they lost the war, but, or they lost the battle, but won the war, okay? They wanted to argue that it was part of cost of goods sold. They lost that argument. But there is another provision in the Texas margin tax, which says that if you've got mandatory flow through state, flow through payments that you have to pay and they're mandatory and they're part of the contract, then you can exclude those subcontractor payments. And so they were allowed to exclude these subcontractor payments from total revenue, but they weren't able to include it in cost of goods sold. So another little definitional step in what constitutes cost of goods sold in, in, in Texas. And another one, the other Sun State case, we had a construction company. They couldn't deduct certain delivery and pickup costs for Texas franchise tax purposes. You know, some of their costs related to rented equipment being used in construction will, in, will count or uh, qualify uh, for cost of goods calculation, but costs, administrative or overhead costs to get the equipment there and get it out, that is not going to uh, qualify. And then finally, the third one, this was a movie theater business. And you, you know, at first blush, when you look at this, you, you, you kind of want to say to yourself, Okay, wait a minute, let me get this right. The movie theater tried to argue that they should be able to deduct their film that they're showing as a cost of goods sold for Texas margin tax. Really? I mean, that sounds a little odd. I didn't realize they'd legalized marijuana in Texas. Uh, how did someone come up with this idea? Well, keep in mind that in a sales tax environment, Streaming services, you know, can be include can be counted as tangible personal property. Okay, and digital goods can be many times considered tangible personal property. And so, as a consequence, American Malta Cinema is saying, "Well, look, when we're showing a film, then arguably, don't we have a cost of goods sold at, with respect to the cost of that film?" And unfortunately, this has been. Another case that's been going on for a while, 
uh, we're not going to see the end of these issues because we have not clearly defined what is a digital good, what is software as a service. And so um, we'll continue to see these kinds of issues come up, but at least for this piece of it in Texas, we, we do have some, some direction. <clears throat> okay, uh, there's a few income tax cases I wanna bring to your attention that, that were handed down this last year. Okay, and this first one, Honigman, Honigman Miller, Shorts and Con. Okay, this is a law firm in Detroit. And this was a really interesting case because, you know, the question was, the law firm is in New York, the attorneys are sitting, or not New York, I'm sorry, Detroit. They're in Detroit, they're sitting there working on court cases and litigation and drawing up legal documents for all their clients. And the question is, where should they source that income? Should they source the income to the client's office where the benefit of that service is being received. Uh, that has been the trend the last few years with the sales factor is more and more states are moving towards sourcing service sales based on where the benefit of the service is received, okay? Or should they source this service, these services for the sales factor into Detroit in their office where they're actually working, okay? And, and there was a sort of a theological debate going on about the difference between a service being rendered or a service being performed. Um, you know, they, they used the word rendered in the sales tax when th this was, uh, Detroit had a three-factor apportionment rule, property, payroll, and sales uh, at this time. And um, for the payroll factor, they used the word services being performed in Detroit. But for the sales factor, they talked about services being rendered in Detroit. And so you had this almost biblical argument over, okay, is, does rendered mean the same thing as performed or does rendered means, mean that it's actually where the benefit of the service is being received? That was what the taxpayer was trying to argue is that, look, we're doing all this work for people all over the United States. And so we should really be sourcing those sales to where the benefit of that service is received. And that's what rendered means. And the city was coming back and arguing, no, 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 it's just another way of saying performed. And uh, unfortunately for the law firm, uh, they lost that argument and uh, it is a Michigan Supreme Court case. So that'll be binding in Michigan. Um, this is a, it's an interesting issue to look at simply because it is not clear. There is not a lo lot of good guidance out there among state and local tax um, and, and states over how to apportion service businesses such as a law firm, an architectural firm, an engineering firm. Um, you know, let, let, let me just throw out a question. So let's say, you know, the, the law firm in Detroit, they close down their office and everyone's working from home. So now do we get to source all of that income outside of Detroit because everybody's working from home? You know, I mean, how is that gonna be, you know, there's a lot of impact to COVID and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but nevertheless, uh, this is gonna be an issue. We don't have guidance, we don't have direction. You know, one of the frustrating things in state and local tax and why some people really hate it so much is that, you know, you can go to California or Texas or New York, and if you've got a state and local tax question, there's a pretty good chance. It's a big state. Those are big states. There's a pretty good chance that someone, somewhere, has posed the same question or a question similar enough where you can go and get some guidance as to where the state's mind is on that, that particular position. That is very difficult to do once you get away from the large states, okay? If you were to say you wanted to know whether or not, let's say you had a 338H10 and you wanted to know whether or not the intermediary transaction in that 338H10 was subject to sales tax in Colorado, you're never gonna find out. There's no direction on that, okay? Um, so, Anyway, th this is always the problem because when you're doing work in state and local tax, I mean, if you're like me, 
you know, you get these questions and you're looking in some state like North Dakota or Arkansas or whatnot, and you spend a couple hours. And I remember when I was in public accounting, those billable hours and, oh, gee, can we bill the client for this? I've spent two hours and I haven't found an answer. Now, did I not find an answer because uh, I'm really slow and I'm stupid and, and it's there and I just missed it? You know, I mean, we all have days like that. I have a lot of days like that. Okay. Or was it the fact that there is no answer and that's why we couldn't find it? And many times in these smaller states, there aren't any answers. Uh, especially in uh, right now when we have all these changes with respect to sourcing sales for services in, in the sales factor. Okay, no hey, industry. Hey Bruce, yeah. we have a question really quick. Okay, yeah, let me see, the, hold on, let me, I can click on something and see that question, right? Yeah, Q&A. Yep. So is Michigan applying sales taxes to services and not just products? Um, they have certain enumerated services, but this case that we're talking about here was an income tax case. And the question was whether or not we source the sale for the sales factor for income tax apportionment. Uh, Michigan, like many other states, does apply sales tax to certain enumerated services, but they're limited services. I, I have not heard, somebody weigh in here if I'm, I'm incorrect, but I have not heard that Michigan has uh, broadened their sales tax base significantly on services. Now, we are seeing more and more states do that, uh, but uh, I don't believe Michigan, Michigan has done that. You know, we have a state right next door here in Colorado, South Dakota. They tax almost all services. I mean, if you do a tax return for somebody in South Dakota, it's subject to sales tax. If you do a, uh, you know, if you do a financial statement for somebody in South Dakota, it's subject to sales tax. It's uh, interesting. They're, they're one of the few states that have a very broad based base for sales tax purposes. But I don't think Michigan's there yet. Give them time. Give them time. They'll get there. <laughs> okay. Null industries. This case is a real puzzle because we've got a corporation, Noel, I think, they think the gentleman's name was Mike, Mike Noel. And he started a business where he's selling um, military equipment to the federal government. He, he actually used to be a Navy SEAL. And he started this business back in 1998 or 1999. And uh, anyway, he sets up he sells the business to an LL to another corporation, okay? But he owns 78% of this other corporation. But he sells the business to this other corporation, this other LLC. And uh, and then uh, in 2010, he goes and sells the corporate taxpayer sells its interest in this LLC, this interest in which they own 78%. And the question was, is that business income apportionable to Idaho? I think if you were to do a survey of most practitioners, they would say, well, sure. I mean, he owns 78%. How could that not be, you know, business income? Well, uh, it wasn't. The uh, Idaho Supreme Court said it didn't qualify as business income, and Idaho has both the tr traditional transactional test for defining business income and the functional test for defining business income. You know, the transactional test simply says, you know, is what you're selling, <coughs> excuse me, is what you're selling part of your, your routine, daily, ordinary, regular sales? In other words, if you're selling widgets, Okay, then, uh, you know, uh, did you sell a widget? Okay, that would be your transactional test. Well, obviously, if you're selling a business, unless you're in the business of buying and selling other businesses, but a single sale of a business isn't going to meet the transactional test. So most states, including Idaho, or many states, including Idaho, have a second test, a functional test. And the argument is, okay, if it meets a, if, if whatever is being sold is a key integral part of that other business that you're running, then it still qualifies as business income and it has to be apportioned 
not allocated. You know, the, the traditional example we always have here is, you know, let's say I've got a, I've got a manufacturing company and I've got two, two plants. I've got one in Colorado and I've got one in Kansas, okay? And I manufacture widgets. Um, I don't like to use widgets as an example because I have no idea what a widget is. You know, we should, we should update, you know, may, maybe I manufacture crack cocaine or something. I don't know, but think of something more jazzy than widgets. But anyway, we'll stick with widgets for now. So anyway, sales drop off. I decide to close the facility in Kansas. And so I close it, I put it on the market, I sell it for $100 million. That $100 million, the question is, should that $100 million gain be allocated completely and totally to Kansas as non-business income, or should it be treated as business income and the $100 million gain apportioned between both Colorado and Kansas? Now, you can imagine a Kansas revenue um, agent will probably want to argue that, no, that's non-business income and it should all be allocated to Kansas because that's where the facility was. And plus, you know, when we were taking depreciation on that company and we we're filing a consolidated return, did we carve out the depreciation expense and all the other expenses and only allocate them to Kansas? No, we didn't do that. We treated it all as one, one central entity, okay? And so, you know, that's the functional test. Uh, they'll say, well, it was key, it was integral. It was, it was an essential part of your operations. Well, here, this taxpayer successfully argued that no, what I have is a corporation that's a holding company. I don't do anything. It's not, the, uh, the only operations I have is I hold an interest in two companies and this is one of them and I sold it. It's really just an investment. And so it should be actually allocated, my gains should be allocated to Virginia, which is my commercial domicile, not to Idaho uh, as part of business income. And this taxpayer won that case. This is an unusual win because clearly the trend has been the last 20 years that almost everything is business income. In fact, I've often said, and, and, and don't quote me on this because obviously I'm wrong when you look at this case, I've obviously said that really the default most of the time is when you have a sale like this, it's gonna be business income. And if you wanna argue it's non-business income, you better come up with a really solid argument based on that state's rules. And most states have adopted both the traditional and functional test. <coughs> and so you rarely see cases like this, but here is one. So. Uh, you know, that gives me pause. Maybe there's still an argument to be made uh, at times that we've got non-business allocable income instead of business apportionable income. All right, uh, what else do we have here? Sunbelt rentals. Okay, the issue here in Maryland is, and, and this is something we run into fairly frequently. So let's say you've got a company uh, let's say you're a Colorado, well, we'll just use Sunbelt Rentals. They're a Maryland uh, taxpayer, okay? And what they did was they merged with two other companies and these two other companies were not Maryland taxpayers, okay? And these other two companies they merged with had NOLs. And so the company files with these two loss companies and takes advantage of those NOLs to offset their Maryland income from the, the corporate parent. And Maryland comes in and says, wait a minute, you can't do that. Those NOLs were incurred before you even own these companies. Those NOLs were incurred in other states. We're not gonna let you take those NOLs and use them against Maryland income, okay? Now this is a fairly common response by states. Now some states sometimes will follow the traditional rules with, you know, 382 limitations and that sort of thing. They'll piggyback off the federal and treatment of NOLs. But it's not unusual for a state to say in an instance like this, no, you can't do that, okay? Well, <coughs> in this case, the taxpayer won, okay? So if you are going to do an acquisition or merger and you've got this issue, 
uh, I would take a look at this court case. There's some good discussion and argument over the, the not just the statutory language in Maryland, but the whole sort of theory around you know using NOLs uh, of companies that you know didn't incur the NOL in in the state that you're currently in. So something worth taking a look at. Uh, Robert Half. Okay, this case is interesting just very quickly because it's California case. And the question was, you know, when you say all gross receipts, when you're talking about the sales factor and you're talking about income tax apportionment, when you say all gross receipts, do you mean, you know, like California will say, okay, if you have sales tax, that becomes part of your gross receipts, it becomes part of your sales factor, okay? But Robert Half isn't selling tangible personal property. There's no sales tax on their services. However, they do have to pay value added taxes and GST taxes in Canada. And so the question was, okay, do you include those taxes when you're talking about gross sales? Okay, if I include those taxes as part of my gross sales in my denominator, do I also have to include it in my numerator to be consistent? So that was really the question. And, and the short answer is all gross seats means exactly what it says, all gross seats. Um, and so even if you're talking about services, not sales of tangible personal property, we're gonna include those things in, in the sales factor. Okay, so let's take a look at a few uh, sales tax cases. Now, I know some of you are going to look at this and, and, and think, boy, this is really silly, Bruce, but I don't think it's so silly. DI supply, okay? The question is, we, we've actually had litigation in Colorado on this and, and the taxpayer lost and, and this taxpayer lost as well. But the question was, you go rent a room at a hotel, you walk into the room, what do you got? You got a bed, you got a television, okay? Uh, you got a TV remote you don't want to touch before you put it into a plastic, you know, uh, bag so you don't, whatever. Okay, you've got beds, you got televisions, you got lamps, you got sheets, you got blankets, you got soap, you got shampoo, all this stuff that you expect to get when you rent the hotel room. And when you rent the hotel room, they charge you sales tax on the entire amount. Okay. So this, this taxpayer said, well, wait a minute, can I make an argument that I'm buying all these things for resale? That, you know, I'm actually buying the blankets and the beds and the televisions and stuff, and I'm reselling them. Okay. And at, at first blush, you kind of look at this and you say, no, no, you're not you're not really reselling tangible personal property here. What you're really doing is providing a service, okay? And, uh, you know, it's a service that's a taxable service. Room accommodations are usually taxable services. They're not usually rentals of tangible personal property. And so, you know, at first blush, you think, oh, well, this is kind of silly. Why would you make this argument? But I don't think it is that silly. And as a matter of fact, there have been one or two taxpayers who have won this argument in other states. And, and let, let me throw this out to you. What if the hotel separately stated it? What if when you checked in, you paid you know, $150 for the room and you paid $50 for the rental of the bed, television, sheets, blankets, and so on. And they separately stated it and they charged sales tax on those items. Would you get the same answer? I'm not sure you would. Because you know, one of the odd things about sales tax, and this, this is something that often trips us up, is with sales tax, um, the form can trump substance. You know, we're all used to the argument in income tax that that the IRS might come in and argue, you know, substance over form. They're going to look at the transaction and they're going to say, well, what really happened here? I mean, you know, what, what is the economic real reality? What is the underlying economic uh, uh, economics of this transaction? And whatever it is, we're going to invoke economics, you know, over form. And that's how we're going to tax it. Okay. Sales tax, that's not true. That's not a, that's a court created doctrine 
economic substance over legal form. That's a court created doctrine for income tax. Okay. So it's not necessarily something that you can drag over into the sales tax arena. In fact, in sales tax, many times form trumps substance. <coughs> Excuse me, let me give you a very quick example. You call a plumber to come out and fix something in your house, replace the garbage disposal. Okay, the plumber comes out and the plumber charges you $100 for spending an hour at your house and they, they have to replace your garbage disposal and they charge $150 for the garbage disposal. If they separately stated on their invoice, they only have to charge in many states, they only have to charge sales tax on the garbage disposal because services, labor isn't subject to sales tax. So if they separately state it, charge $100 for the services, $150 for the, for the uh, garbage disposal, then they only have to charge sales tax on the garbage disposal. In most of the states that follow that, what happens if the plumber just goes out there and charges 250 bucks? In every one of those states, those states are gonna say, well, now there's sales tax on the whole thing because you didn't separately state it. So that's a perfect example of form trumping substance because the underlying transaction is exactly the same. So I don't think this case is really as, as uh, crazy as it initially seems. And, uh, you know, because it goes to the heart of one of these questions we have over sales tax and substance over form. Okay, this case, I'm not gonna talk too much about this. Microsoft had a case with California a few years ago in which California tried to impose sales tax on uh, Microsoft because Microsoft provided software that original equipment manufacturers, OEMs were using to, to manufacture their laptops and so on. And uh, California tried to impose sales tax on it. They lost that case. Uh, Wisconsin has uh, tried to make the same argument and they've lost that case as well. You know, basically the issue here is the court said there's no transaction here between Microsoft and the end user, okay? The transaction is between Microsoft and the OEM and the OEM is buying it for resale. And so uh, it's not a taxable transaction. Uh, Gartner Inc. in Washington. <clears throat> I just love the state of Washington, don't you? I mean, first of all, I run into clients who, you know, they're paying sales tax. They've got a sales tax license in Washington and they're charging sales tax and everything. And then they get a notice from Washington and they're saying, and Washington says, look, you got to pay our B&O tax. And the response of, of clients is, well, wait a minute, I'm already paying their sales tax. I, you mean I have to pay the B&O tax too, the business and occupation tax? Yeah, it's a gross receipts tax. Washington doesn't have a traditional income tax. They have a sales tax and a gross receipts tax, and you have to pay the gross receipts tax as well. Well, so anyway, and Washington is one of the few states that does have a very detailed regulation on what constitutes digital goods and what constitutes software as a service. And in this case, this information technology firm they were selling online access to their research lab library, you know, could, you know, think in terms of, you know, CCH or RIA or Checkpoint or whatnot. You know, they're selling online access to the research library. And uh, Washington came in and said, no, nope, that is subject to our business and occupation tax, uh, subject to our gross receipts tax, because we impose our gross receipts tax on digital automated services. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Citrix Systems, Massachusetts. Okay. The issue here, again, this was a SAS case. Okay. So I, I've just included this because, you know, we're seeing more and more litigation on software as a service. And then, and, and of course, the movement, the direction this is all moving is states are, are taking the position that software as a service, generally speaking, is going to be subject to sales tax. That seems to be the trend. You have some major exceptions. You know, California says that software service, software as a service is not subject to sales tax. Uh, Colorado says it's not subject to sales tax. So you've got some out there. But more and more states are arguing that this is really, you know, you're really just getting the software. 
Okay, it's almost an economic substance argument, you know, which is odd. You're, you're really just getting the software. And so therefore it's subject to sales tax. You know, the, the fundamental problem here with all of these, this litigation on digital goods and software as a service, not only there's a, there's a problem with no guidance, there's also a problem with many states are trying to pull these things in to a framework uh, in which none of this was anticipated. Most of our sales tax laws in, in the United States were imposed either in the 1930s because of the Great Depression, or they were enacted in the early 60s, okay? And obviously no one had software as a service back in the 1930s or the 1960s. And so, you know, but states, it's easier to try and expand the revenue department to expand its definition of what's gonna to constitute tangible personal property than it is to go to the legislature and say, hey, look, we need to change the law if we're going to tax this. Um, so this is this is gonna be, a, a, again, one of those ongoing issues that uh, is gonna remain unsettled here for a couple of years. All right, what else do we have? Oh, Chuck E. Cheese, I threw this one in. Um, you know, I saw some of you uh, had a little baby there and I know some of you have small children. Um, I'm really glad that my daughter is 36 and I've already put behind me those years where I had to go to Chuck E. Cheese. I really think that Chuck E. Cheese is as is, is close to hell on earth as you can get if you're an adult, okay? But anyway, Chuck E. Cheese was trying to make an argument that they're coin operated gaming equipment that they should buy that as a sale for resale because essentially when someone is using that equipment, they're renting the equipment, okay? That was their argument. These people, you know, they put their quarters in or their dollars or whatever, and they're renting the equipment. And so we should be able to buy this for a sale for resale. Court was not convinced and a Texas Supreme Court didn't even review the appellate decision. Um, so, but again, we're gonna see this this, this, this kind of issue come up uh, again. All right, nationwide mutual insurance. I put this case in here because again, this goes to heart the heart of a problem that is perennial and that we run into in sales tax all the time, okay? And that is, what is the distinction between a real property contract and a retail sale of tangible personal property or a fixture, okay? And, you know, in many states, the, the way the contractor rule usually works is that the sales tax is on the end user of the tangible personal property. And so in many states, what that means is if I'm a general contractor and I'm gonna build you a house, I should simply pay sales tax on all the materials that I've purchased because I'm the end user of the tangible personal property because once I buy that property, it's gonna be consumed in the creation of real property, okay? And there's no sales tax on real property. So I'm the end user of the tangible personal property as tangible personal property. And so I should simply pay tax on that, okay? Well, is cabling construction materials? You know, so let's say I've got my house built. And I decide that I want to have somebody come in and put in a burglar alarm system. And so they, they run a bunch of, uh, you know, cabling behind all the walls. They install a bunch of cameras here and there and whatnot. Um, is that a contract job on real property? Uh, does it make a difference if it's new construction as opposed to the house is already there and this is an improvement? Okay. When does that sort of thing... <coughs> What if I buy a warehouse and I'm gonna convert it into a server farm? And so I put in uh, an additional floor in the warehouse that's elevated about two feet and with all these cooling machines underneath it so I can keep all my servers uh, cool. Okay, and, and, and let's say I build it as part of the, a new building or I build it as part of a warehouse that I already own. Is that a real property contract or is that a time and material contract? I mean, this is a problem. Again, we have some states like Massachusetts and California where they have some really clear guidelines on how these things should be laid out, okay? 
But nevertheless, every year there are perennial arguments over, you know, whether I did not, I did a time material contract or a contract job on real property. And many times it's about a smaller improvement. So an example I always use is, you know, let's say that I, um, you know, Kathy, my wife, we've been married for 42 years. Uh, I'm very fortunate. And she uh, comes to me and she says, you know, I want to replace the, the door on the front of the house. I don't know what's wrong with it, but she wants to replace it. Okay. I, we have a single door with a side light. Okay. So, or no, we just have a single door. I guess we don't have a side light. So, so she comes in and she says, look, what I want to do is I want to replace it with two doors and I want side lights on both sides of the doors. Okay. So now I could go, you know, if I were any good with, you know, woodworking, I could go to Home Depot and I could buy doors and I could, you know, saw it all out and put it in, but I, I can't do that. So I hire a contractor to do it. And the contractor comes back and says, I'll do the whole thing for a lump sum of, you know, 3,500 bucks because they're fancy doors. Right. And uh, so does he, does he have to charge me sales tax on the 30, full $3,500? Or what if he comes back and he says to me, I'll tell you what, um, <coughs> I'll charge you time material. I'm going to charge you uh, $1,800 for, uh, for the materials and $700 for uh, my labor. And I'll break it out and I'll only charge you sales tax on the $1,700. Can he do that? I mean, that's the question is, is this a real property contract? It seems to me that you will, if you ask an auditor, you will get more than one, one answer to that from different auditors. In fact, you might get different answers from the same auditor on whether or not it's a real property contract. So I threw this case in here because it, it, it's an old issue, but it's an issue that we're going, that we struggle with uh, every year. And so there's some useful guidance and um, some thoughtful writing in this case that's worth taking a look at. The Oracle case, this here, this is, there's a refund opportunity here. Um, Massachusetts, you know, that state where the uh, American Revolution started that we talked about earlier. Uh, well, Massachusetts has this rule that let's say you sell 20 licenses to somebody in Boston, okay? 20 licenses to use Microsoft Office to somebody in Boston, but they're not gonna use all the licenses in their Boston office. They're gonna use 10 of the 20 licenses in Boston and the other 10 they're gonna use in New Hampshire, okay? If on the initial purchase, you know that, they, may, they attest that that's what's gonna happen, you only have to charge them sales tax on the 10 licenses being used in Massachusetts, and you don't have to charge sales tax on the 10 licenses being used in New Hampshire because <coughs> New Hampshire doesn't have a sales tax, okay? Massachusetts took the position that you have to have that specifically broken out in your initial sales invoice or contract. And if you don't, then you can't go back and amend it. This was challenged by Oracle. Oracle won, Massachusetts lost. So if you've had that issue with Massachusetts, there's a possible refund opportunity there uh, to go back and file amended returns and, and, and get some of that, 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 that money back. Okay, CARES Act and state responses. Um, you know, we could, and we could easily spend a couple hours on this and we certainly don't have the time to do that. So what I want to do is I wanna draw your attention to what you should be watching out for in the CARES Act and the state responses to the same. First of all, net operating losses. You know, the CARES Act allowed NOLs that were generated in 2018, um, 19 uh, to be carried back five years and they waive the 80% TCJA limitation, okay? Uh, many states are decoupling from that. Uh, the CARES Act eliminated the excess business loss uh, deduction. Also, the TCJA business interest expense deduction was limited to 30% of your ATI, adjusted taxable income. Okay, and the CARES Act bumped that up to 50%. And again, 
uh, there are a lot of states who are not following that. They're decoupling from that. And then, of course, we had that error with uh, in the TCJA where qualified improvement property was supposed to have a 15-year life, uh, but they messed up and it ended up with a 39-year life. And so now they, uh, you know, they fix that in the CARES Act. And again, there are some states like Colorado that are decoupling from this. Now, the good news is this, okay, is that almost everybody and their mother are putting together charts on this. So, you know, it'll save you time. You go to any of the big four accounting firms, KPMG, Ernst & Young, PwC, you know, whoever, you know, they'll have charts that list all the state changes and who's decoupling from what. In fact, um, many of the top accounting firms, you know, probably the top 20 accounting firms have charts that are free that you can use to help you, you know, uh, make progress in sorting out, you know, who's doing what, okay? Uh, so we're, and we don't have the time to go into all of that anyway. So I just, you know, guide you to those, take a look at that as your starting point for determining, uh, you know, who's doing what with, with respect to COVID. What I wanna end up with and talk about here is the COVID impact on Nexus and telecommuting. I wanna say a few words about that. Um, the implications of working remotely for the employer are many, okay? So, uh, and let's take Massachusetts and New Hampshire because they're in a bit of a dogfight right now over this. Is there are a lot of people who live in Massachusetts or live in uh, New Hampshire that work in Massachusetts, okay? New Hampshire doesn't have an income tax and they don't have a sales tax, okay? So, you know, you're working in Massachusetts and, um, and you're paying tax to Massachusetts because you work there, okay? But now COVID comes along and the boss says, okay, everybody works from home now, okay? And so you're working at home in New Hampshire. Now you've been working at home in New Hampshire since the 1st of March and it's October. And uh, you're starting to sit there and think, well, wait a minute, why am I still paying taxes to Massachusetts when I'm not, I mean, if I have a fire, I don't call a Massachusetts fire department. If someone kind of breaks into my house, I'm not gonna call a Massachusetts cop. I mean, you know, I'm in New Hampshire. I mean, Massachusetts is not giving me anything in return for the taxes they're demanding from me. Uh, I think that's called what? Taxation without representation or something like that. Anyway, okay, so you see my point. And so New Hampshire is trying to work out something with Massachusetts to say, look, you know, it'd be one thing if people are only working from home for a few days, but if they're working from New Hampshire for six months, then they shouldn't be paying Massachusetts tax anymore, okay? So now you're the employer. And Massachusetts tells you one thing and New Hampshire tells you something else. What are you going to do? So you've got, quite, you've got issues with wage withholding. You have issues with unemployment taxes. You have issues for nexus. Okay, so now let's say you're a Massachusetts company and you don't have nexus with New Hampshire. Will New Hampshire come along and say, oh, guess what? You've got a bunch of employees working in our state now. So you've got to start filing uh, New Hampshire income tax returns. Um, you know, or in sale, New Hampshire doesn't have a sales tax, but you know, other states might argue, well, now you've got physical presence and economic presence in our state, so you should collect that. And workers' comp issues, data protection, confidence. I mean, you, as an employer, you've got a lot of nightmares. <coughs> and for the employee, you could actually end up paying taxes to more than one state, okay? Now, generally speaking, you know, you can take a credit. If I were to go work in Kansas for a couple of months and then come back to Colorado, I would file a non-resident Kansas return. I would pay taxes to Kansas and then I'd take a credit on my, my Colorado income tax return. Well, that might be all fine and good uh, if Kansas and Colorado have similar tax rates because Colorado's gonna give me a credit for my taxes up to a maximum of what Kansas has imposed, but no higher, okay? Or up to what the Colorado rate is imposed. I'm sorry, forgive me, but no higher. So, you know, the tax rate here in Colorado this year is 4.5%. Well, 
what if I was working in California and the California rate is eight or 9% for my tax bracket? I'm only going to get a credit for 4.5 on my California or my Colorado return. So, and then we, and then we've got questions about residency and domicile, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's raised a whole host of issues. And this, these are the things you need to, to look at if you've run into that. Now, fortunately, we live out in the West for those of us who live in Colorado. And so we don't have a lot of states nearby, you know, like they do in New England or on the East Coast where, you know, if you miss an exit, you know, all of a sudden you're not in Connecticut anymore, you're in Rhode Island, okay? Uh, so it's not as big a problem for us, but for companies that have employees all over the country, it can be. Now, we have some nice states out there, okay, who have actually issued guidance saying, look, don't worry about it. We understand this is temporary, okay? So, uh, you know, you're not gonna create Nexus in New Jersey because now you got people working in New Jersey from home and you don't otherwise have a filing obligation in New Jersey. So there's a series of states that have issued guidance saying, you know, don't worry about it. We're just going to treat it as things have always been. Well, the problem with that is, again, look, Massachusetts is on that list. They're saying, look, this is temporary. Don't worry about it. You just continue to pay your Massachusetts tax. And New Hampshire is saying, wait, 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 wait a minute. It's been too long, okay? So, but we do have some nice states that are telling employers, don't worry, you haven't created a filing obligation if you, some of your employees now are telecommuting from home, okay? And there's one other issue here that I want to talk about that, that is a surprise to many, many people, and we'll, we'll end with this. And that is, there's something called the convenience of the employer rule, okay? And the, and the way this works is it says that if you're a non-resident employee, okay, and you're working outside the state, and you're doing that for the convenience of the employer, okay, uh, that's one thing, okay? Then, then you pay taxes to the state you're working in, and, and we'll give you a credit for those taxes if you're a resident of our state, okay? But then there's some states out there that say, no, 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 that's not the way we do it, okay? And look at the example I have there on the sl slide, because Nebraska is one of these states. For example, a Colorado resident takes a job with a Nebraska corporation. Now, for obvious reasons, okay, the Colorado resident doesn't want to move to Nebraska. Okay, now before all of you who are from Nebraska send me nasty emails and everything, I mean, I understand, you know, Nebraskans are nice folks, but really, do you want to move back there? No, okay, and I can say that because I'm from Nebraska, all right. So anyway, uh, but so for obvious reasons, the Colorado resident doesn't want to move to Nebraska. And the resident says, look, you know, I'm just a computer programmer. I can work from anywhere. Why don't I just work from my home here in Colorado? And the Nebraska Corporation, they're nice folks. And they say, yeah, sure, that's not a problem. Okay, you can do that. But the Nebraska Department of Revenue will say, you know what? Okay, I, we don't care that you're a Colorado resident. And we don't care that you're working in Colorado all the time. You're not doing that for the convenience of the employer. You're doing that for the, your convenience. You want to live in Colorado. You want to work from home. That, that's something else. That's not a requirement of your job. And so that's still Nebraska sourced income and you're gonna have to file and pay taxes to Nebraska on all of your income that you're earning from that company, okay? And, uh, and there are uh, several states that have, here I have the seven deadly states uh, that have a convenience of the employer rule. New York is the most notorious. There's actually litigation in New York. There was a gentleman who got, who was living in Tennessee, took a job with a New York company, didn't want to move to New York City, stayed in Tennessee, and New York taxed him on all of his income. And, uh, you know, he litigated it and he lost. So there's been a couple of people who have lost this case in New York and in other states. Uh, so you might run into this with respect to some of your employees uh, or if you're an employer. So keep that in mind. Um, I'm out of time. Uh, it's 3.30.
Uh, I'm going to hand it back to Jordan and company. And uh, thank you very much, everybody.